the 10 biggest battles in history. We'll start with the most ancient battle and finish with the most recent, moving through time to reveal each one. I've painstakingly recreated each battlefield and animated the movements of the troops myself, so that by the end of this video, you'll have a basic understanding of what happened in each battle and why they're so famous. Now what makes a battle important is not only how many people fought in it, but who fought in it, why they fought, how close it was, and how the result impacted human history, and even our lives today. The first battle takes place in 331 BC, Gogamela in modern day Iraq. Here, Alexander the Great stands against the King of Kings, Darius III. Let's meet the troops. Alexander's army consists of 47,000 well-trained, experienced infantry and cavalry units, featuring strong phalanx formations of pikemen carrying long Sarissa pikes. On the other side, Darius III's Persian army far outnumber them, with an estimated 200,000 men. Now, many of these are low-quality infantry units, but some of them are actually really impressive, like the Immortals, an elite Persian guard unit, and scythe blade war chariots, one of which carries Darius himself. And don't forget about the war elephants, because they sure won't forget about you. Get it? Because they're elephants. This isn't the first time Alexander the Great has faced Darius in battle. Alexander is deep into his campaign in Persia at this point and shows no signs of stopping. He wants to conquer absolutely everything, and it looks like he might do just that. He first crossed into Persia two years earlier and defeated Darius at Issus, destroying much of the Persian army. But Darius got away and was able to draw on the vast population and resources of the Persian Empire to create another huge army. Now, once again, he's trying to stop Alexander from curb stopping his empire. He even tried to negotiate with Alexander multiple times, offering him money and a good chunk of the Persian Empire if he just went back to Macedonia. But Alexander refused. There could only be one King of Asia. Darius chose this battlefield because it was wide and flat, allowing him to use his superior numbers and chariots to their full extent. He was doing everything in his power to give himself the advantage. But would it be enough? Alexander led his cavalry at an angle toward the massive Persian center, with light infantry just behind and the powerful phalanx units in the rear. In response, Darius ordered his cavalry to swing out wide, and his scythe chariots to sweep around the other direction to mow down the Greek phalanx units. But the light infantry with Alexander quickly started harassing the chariots with ranged attacks, and they were able to kill enough chariot drivers and horses to slow them down. When they finally reached the phalanx units, the soldiers simply stepped aside and let the chariots pass through. This allowed even more Persian cavalry to break through the line. But instead of exploiting this position, they kept going all the way to the Greek base camp to loot it. Now there was a huge gap in the Persian line, and Alexander went for the jugular. He charged right up to Darius, and the King of Kings turned around and fled. Seeing your king run away is not exactly the most inspiring thing, so many of the Persian troops also broke and ran. Alexander wasn't able to chase after them though, because one of his best generals, Parminian, needed help on the left flank. So Alexander turned around and charged the Persians from behind, dealing the crushing blow to end the battle. It was a complete victory for Alexander, and with Darius on the run and the Persian army vanquished, he had free access to the rest of the continent. This single battle had ended the Persian Empire. Alexander would go on to spread Greek ideas and culture across the known world, impacting human history for centuries to come. Our next battle is very different from Gagamela. It's the smallest battle on this list, but its importance can't be overstated. The year is 624 AD, and 900 men from Mecca stand against 300 men under the command of Muhammad. He had just upset some merchants in Mecca with his new teachings that were becoming popular, and now they wanted to silence him once and for all. Muhammad had amassed a small but devout following from Medina, composed mostly of infantry and a couple horses and some camels. They were heavily outnumbered by the force from Mecca, who had hundreds of horses and camels and better equipment. 
This larger force was tired and thirsty and decided to go cool off at the well of Badr, just outside of Mecca. But Muhammad was waiting for them with his rested and determined followers. When the battle began, it's said that a sandstorm came through, causing confusion and chaos amongst the Meccan force. When the dust cleared, 70 Meccans were dead and 70 more captured. Muhammad had come out on top. This moment was critical for the young prophet's rise to power, and it marked his ascent from humble gang leader to a more established political and military leader. Six years later, he would take over Mecca itself and establish Islam. But it all began in just a small battle of just over a thousand men here at Badr. If things had gone even slightly differently that day, the religion of Islam may not have spread in the Middle East, and our world would look very, very different today. Now let's jump ahead about 400 years and head up to Britain. The Battle of Hastings is one of the most pivotal moments in all of British history, and it all came down to a battle that could have gone either way. King Edward the Confessor had just died, and now there was a dispute over who would rule England next. Deciding the next king was a complicated matter because there were multiple candidates making their claim. English nobles named Harold Godwinson as the next king, but William the Duke of Normandy said he was supposed to be next in line. He decided to take the crown by force and invaded England. King Harold was also fighting off a third player claiming the throne, and it was his own brother. But right now, he had to defend England from the invading Norman army. His men are an impressive group of soldiers, especially his housecarls, professional fighters with long Viking-style axes. The rest of his army was made up of militiamen who were obligated to serve some time in battle. The two armies met on Senlac Hill. King Harold occupied the high ground on top of the hill, overlooking William's invading army. Both sides had some archers, including crossbows, which were being used in battle for the first time today. Both sides had around 7,000 men, but William had the most powerful unit of this era. 2,000 horse-mounted cavalry knights, who could now use heavy lances in battle thanks to the recent invention of the stirrup. These horsemen would play a key role in the battle that was about to take place. But King Harold was in the perfect position at the top of the hill. His soldiers were lined up in a strong defensive formation, a wall of shields, and they'd be at a huge advantage with the high ground if they could just remain disciplined and keep the shield wall intact. William attacked with archers, then his infantry, then his cavalry. The shield wall held and William was forced to fall back. But when he fell back, some of the less disciplined militiamen left the shield wall and charged after the retreating soldiers. But then they got isolated and William crushed them in the open field. It didn't weaken the shield wall that much though, and William still couldn't break it later in the day with continued assaults. And then William had an idea. He would try to fake out the English. He told his men to pretend to run away in terror and act super scared. It actually worked. This time, a huge portion of the English militia left the shield wall and charged after the fleeing invading army. Wait a second, what's that sound? It was the thunderous roar of charging knights. William's cavalry obliterated the exposed English militiamen, and his archers began to rain down arrows on the remaining English at the top of the hill, right where King Harold was standing. There, in front of his men, he took an arrow to the face. Needless to say, that ended the battle. William went on to conquer all of England and completely change the direction the country was headed. Up until this point, the British had been heavily influenced by the Saxons and the region was just a loose collection of nobles. But now they were a proper kingdom with a feudal system like the rest of Europe. If it wasn't for this battle, England would have lagged behind Europe and would probably look much different today, almost a thousand years later. And by the way, that was the last time that England was successfully invaded. We head east to the year 1204 AD and the Battle of the Thirteen Sides. An ambitious young leader named Temujin has just spent his last few years trying to do the impossible. Unite all the tribes of Mongolia under a single banner. 
For his entire life, Temujin has experienced nothing but the endless cycle of violence and death that plagued the warring tribes of the Mongolian steppe. Now, after years of progress, he had one last obstacle in his way, and it's his childhood best friend. Jamaka, his blood brother, has grown apart from Temujin, and now finds himself standing across the field, ready for battle. Temujin fields a sizable army of 66,000, but he's way outnumbered by the forces of the remaining tribes that oppose him. So, he comes up with a plan to foil his numerous enemies. He spreads out his cavalry in a long, wide line to make it look like he's trying to envelop the opposing army. Not wanting that to happen, they do the same thing, spreading out wider and wider. Then, on his signal, he grouped his horsemen back to the center and drove hard right down the middle. The effect was devastating, and the leaders of the tribes, including Jamaka, were pinned against the mountains and fled. It was a crushing victory for Temujin, and it concluded his mission to unite the Mongol tribes once and for all. Now, united through bloodshed, he could finally take the combined force of the steppe people and conquer all those who stood before him. What he began here at the base of the Altai Mountains would go on to become the largest contiguous empire in all of human history, and Temujin would become known as Genghis Khan. And by the way, the myth that a percentage of the world's population shares his DNA is not accepted as fact. There are lots of commonly repeated myths and misconceptions about the Mongolian Empire, and I'll be covering that topic in a later video. But for now, let's head over to America, South America. The year is 1532, and Spanish conquistadors have their hands all over the continent searching for gold and silver to amass personal wealth. One in particular, Francisco Pizarro, had heard rumors of a golden kingdom in modern-day Peru, and he took a hundred men and sixty horses to investigate. He had discovered the great Incan Empire. The Incas were a powerful people that had subjugated many smaller tribes by force, and were ruled by a king who was considered a god, similar to the ancient Egyptians. They had some pretty advanced technology, like hydraulic engineering, highway roads, and food processing. But the Spanish had guns. When Pizarro first stepped into the Incan Empire, the leader of the Incas, Atahualpa, didn't consider them much of a threat. It was only a handful of alien men, and he had thousands of warriors camped around him. These strange men had strange creatures with them, which were completely unknown in the Americas until now. So yeah, that must have been a pretty weird experience seeing a horse for the first time ever. Pizarro set up camp in the nearby abandoned fortress of Ka Marca, and decided to come up with a plan to take down the Incas and steal their gold. They might as well have been on another planet because there was no chance of reinforcements or support from home. So, they came up with a scheme that was pure evil. They invited Atahualpa to come visit Ka Marca in peace, and abiding by Incan traditions of honor, Atahualpa agreed to come unarmed. His men filed into the fortress in two columns. But when they got inside, they found something strange. It was completely empty. Where were the Spanish? Suddenly, cannon fire ripped through the closely packed Incan columns. It was a trap. Horsemen with lances charged into the town, cutting down the unarmed tribesmen with ease. Maybe this one shouldn't be on the list, because this was really more of a massacre than a battle. But the impact it had perfectly illustrates how the colonial powers of the day, like the Spanish, used gunpowder, horses, and despicable treachery to eliminate an empire that had ruled for a hundred years. But if you go back to Europe just 50 years later, the Day of Reckoning is about to arrive for the Spanish Empire. This battle, called the Spanish Armada, is one of the most famous sea battles of all time. The British Queen Elizabeth I had been bickering with the Spanish King Philip II relentlessly, but she was very cautious about engaging him in open war, knowing that the English were rather weak at this time. So, to compete with the Spanish, she used pirates like Francis Drake to raid and disrupt their colonial shipments. Tired of losing money and being harassed, the Spanish finally had enough and assembled an armada of 130 ships to invade England. If they could make a landing on her shores, they could easily overpower the relatively weak country. When the ships were ready, they sailed towards England, but were delayed by storms and had to stop to repair for a while. 
Meanwhile, Queen Elizabeth knew it was critical that the Armada be stopped before they could land, so she also sent a huge naval force of 197 ships under the command of Lord Howard of Effingham. When the Spanish Armada sailed into the English Channel on the night of July 20th, Lord Effingham and Francis Drake were ready for them. They sailed around the Spanish fleet so they could come at them from behind with the wind at their backs. Their ships were more nimble than the Spanish, who had slower vessels with larger guns that were best for close-range engagements. The English used smaller cannons that had longer range, so they just danced around the Spanish ships and lobbed shots from three-point range. Realizing this was going poorly, the Spanish Armada tried to get away, and was able to slip off in the darkness. In the morning light, the English sailed right after them. They met again off the Isle of Wight, and again the Spanish were beaten. So now they retreated to the harbor of Calais, and got into a really defensive formation. So the English lit these tiny boats on fire and sailed them towards the Armada. No ships were hit, but they had to scatter to avoid the flames, and chaos ensued, breaking the defensive formation. Once they were out at sea again, the English moved in for the killing blow, using a new tactic called the broadside to light up the Spanish Armada. There was only one more place to run away to. The crippled Spanish ships sailed north to try to get around Scotland and eventually back home, but unusually severe storms blasted them and tons of shipwrecks washed up in Ireland. Only a handful made it back to Spain, and when they limped into the harbor, the Spanish realized how bad the damage was. Their mighty empire had begun its decline, giving way to a new one. England had made an important capture in one of its raids. They found documents detailing the Spanish trade in India. It was these stolen plans that would lead to the British East India Company. With no one left to challenge them at sea, the British were now free to colonize North America, instead of the Spanish. If the Spanish Armada hadn't been shattered, our world would look completely different today. So that little colony that Britain ended up establishing in North America ended up rebelling hard. These revolutionaries beat the British at Saratoga, which convinced France to not only recognize them as a real country, but also join their side. Now, under the command of George Washington, the colonies and the French move in on the British, who are dug in at Yorktown. Washington originally intended to strike New York, but changed his mind. The British, however, intercepted a letter mentioning New York, so they expected him to attack there, where their navy was. When they realized their mistake, they sent the Royal Navy down to say hello. But the French ships got there first and held off the British ships in Chesapeake Bay. George Washington and Marquis de Lafayette moved in and started bombarding the British occupied town. With no backup from the Navy and no way out, the British General Cornwallis was forced to surrender, a humiliating loss to the lowly colonies. This ended the American Revolution and allowed the formation of the United States. The British public were so upset by the loss that they had to reform their entire government, and they also changed how tightly they controlled colonies from then on. And the impact of Yorktown goes even further. The French spent a ton of money aiding the Americans, and now they were completely broke, causing a huge economic disaster which fostered the French Revolution, which happened to be heavily inspired by the ideals of the American Revolution. The French Revolution would give birth to Napoleon. And that brings us to our next battle. I'm currently midway through a documentary series on Napoleon's life, so for those of you watching that, just know this battle contains spoilers. It's actually this battle that ends Napoleon's career. And that's precisely why it's one of the most important battles in history. Napoleon had just returned from exile. His troops, the Grand Armée, had been decimated in Russia, and after losing the Battle of Leipzig, his country had no choice but to agree to his abdication. But now, he's back, and soldiers have flocked to his banner. While he was gone, the French monarchy had been restored, and the people hated it so much that they welcomed Napoleon's return. Now, all of Europe is united against him, but if he can quickly beat the British and Dutch forces and then the nearby Prussians, he can deal with the rest later. The British and Dutch forces are commanded by the Duke of Wellington, a legendary general who was about to write his name down in history. He positioned his men in a line at the top of a long hill, but kept them just behind the ridge to use the land as a natural defensive barrier. 
Napoleon's advance towards Wellington was delayed by heavy rain, but he pushed on nonetheless, determined to get to the British before the Prussians arrived, who were supposed to be nearby with an additional 61,000 troops. Earlier, he had sent one of his generals to harass the Prussians, but he wasn't sure if that had worked or if they'd be joining the battle soon. Napoleon bombarded Wellington with his guns, but it had almost no effect because of the ridgeline. So he ordered his infantry forward in an all-out attack. The British held their ground. Then movement was spotted in the east. It was the Prussians, but Napoleon was convinced he could break the British before they arrived, and he charged with his cavalry. But the British used square formations to keep the horsemen at bay, and before long, the Prussians crashed into the French right flank. For hours, the armies were locked in combat, and even with the French outnumbered, it seemed like the battle could go either way, especially when one of the French generals, Ney, managed to make a breakthrough in the British center. But then Napoleon did something that he almost never did. He made a mistake on the battlefield. Ney had broken through, and the Imperial Guard, the best unit in the French army, stood by, ready to charge in. But Napoleon hesitated. For reasons that are still a mystery today, he decided not to deploy his Imperial Guard, and the gap closed back up. Seeing his chance to strike, it was Wellington who would bring out the dagger. He called for a charge of all his reserves, and they stormed down the hill, sending the French army into full flight. This battle had decisively ended the Napoleonic Wars. But what happened to Napoleon? Well, you'll have to wait for the conclusion of my Napoleon series to find out. Unless you're watching this video after it's been released, in which case you already know what happens. The year is 1916, two years into the Great War. Verdun, a French fortress town, is about to be attacked by a huge German offensive. An offensive with a sinister goal. To inflict as much suffering and death on the French army as possible. The idea from the German high command was that if they could just kill a ton of French people and not die too much in the process, they could turn the tide of the war. Gas and flamethrowers were used for the first time here, and it was absolute hell. But in the midst of hell, the French stood firm. And their rallying cry was epic. They shall not pass. This battle was the longest of World War I, and one of the bloodiest. The French had to keep rotating their men in and out of the battle to keep up the defensive, so a whopping two-thirds of the entire French army fought at one point or another at Verdun. The Germans were unable to take the city, but their plan to inflict as many casualties as possible had worked, I guess. But in doing so, they also got many of their own men killed, and the German army was heavily demoralized. Now, the Allies were planning an offensive of their own at the Somme. The damage both to human life and morale that the German army experienced at Verdun and the Somme was the beginning of their deterioration and eventual collapse. The battle exemplified the horrors of World War I, and also turned the tide. Verdun heavily impacted the French for decades to come. While their stance that day was an incredible rallying cry for the people, it came at such a deadly cost that it was hardly something to celebrate. From then on, they were incredibly hesitant to commit so many men to battle. So in 1936, when Hitler seized the Rhineland, and then Czechoslovakia in 1939, the French, remembering Verdun, trusted in their defensive positions on the Maginot Line and refused to interfere until it was too late. In 1940, the Blitzkrieg had arrived, and their World War I-style defense was overrun. And that brings us to the last battle in this video. Stalingrad in World War II. It really deserves its own video, so I'll likely be revisiting this one. But right now, I'll summarize for you the basics of how it played out, and the implications. There are many interesting and important battles of World War II, all which led to the final outcome of the war. But few can match Stalingrad in intrigue and impact. World War II was fought all over the world, but it was really decided here in the Eastern Front. 
The Germans had their eye on Stalingrad. It was the industrial center for the Russians, and it sat on a river that gave access to tons of oil, something that everyone was short on. But before the Germans even reached Stalingrad, the intense fighting had begun, with 200,000 Soviets losing their lives to slow the German advance. And they hadn't even got to the city yet. So maybe that gives you an idea of how deadly Stalingrad was. The Luftwaffe, German Air Force, firebombed the city, reducing the whole thing to a rubble pile. By the end of the battle, 99% of Stalingrad would be destroyed. 99%. The German 6th Army entered the city, and the meat grinder of death on the streets began. This would be the single largest and costliest urban battle in the entirety of human history. For months, both sides poured their soldiers into the city to meet their death. And there were lots of ways to die. The street is no longer measured in meters, but by corpses. Stalingrad is no longer a town. It is an enormous cloud of burning, blinding smoke. The Soviet resolve to hold on against the Germans was almost unhuman, and they were about to make the hell of Stalingrad freeze over on the Germans. With winter approaching, the Soviets launched Operation Uranus and sent two separate forces to encircle the German 6th Army. When they met behind the German lines, they were overjoyed. The Germans were now cut off from all supplies and help, and the Russian winter had arrived. With Hitler refusing to break the siege even though it was hopeless, the 6th Army was doomed, and they slowly starved and froze to death in the snow. Surrendering to the Soviets wouldn't have been a much better fate. With the 6th Army completely lost, this was the turning point for the war. The nail in the coffin was the Battle of Kursk a few months later, the largest tank battle ever, which the Russians also won. The invasion of Normandy and the defeat of Japan in the Pacific were also important conflicts in ending the war. But the beginning of the end was here in Stalingrad, one of the deadliest and biggest battles in human history.